Hi, and welcome to Topic 6, Financial Statement Analysis. In this topic, we're going to start looking at how to use all this information that we now understand about financial statements, about the statement of profit or loss, about the statement of financial position, and the cash flow statement. So what do they actually mean? How do we use them? How do we put this into action? Uh, so we're going to look at why different user groups look at financial statements and what the purpose of, these, of the financial analysis is all about. We're going to then look at how we apply different methods, so horizontal, trend, vertical, and ratio analysis. We, in this particular video, we won't go into a huge amount of detail with the specific financial ratios, and there are loads of them, um, but these are all well-defined in you know, the current textbook that we're using. They're also defined you know, pretty much anywhere you can look on, on the internet. There are going to be slight variations in terms of how you specifically define some of the ratios, but you know, in broad brushstrokes, they're going to be pretty similar. So again, we're not going to go into the details about the actual calculations within this particular video, but we will talk about what the idea of the ratios are and, and how we use them. Um, there'll be a little bit of discussion at the end towards uh, the interrelationships between ratios and, and how we use this to assess an entity and a few of the limitations around ratio analysis. So there are a number of different external users for financial statements. Uh, these range from those providing resources, so they could be lenders and investors, to those using you know products of the particular company so you know you go down to Woolworths and you're a customer there you know would you necessarily do some financial statement analysis before you go and do your grocery shopping yeah probably not but for other types of uh, recipients of goods or services of different goods or services particularly uh, long-running relationships there may be a good reason to understand uh, the financial security of the particular entity in, in, you know, in its current position. Uh, look, we're certainly seeing that right at the moment with a number of businesses, even quite large businesses and organizations really struggling uh, with the downturn. Regulators in government would be obviously quite interested in this sort of information, certainly the tax authorities, for example. And internal management will all, always be interested to look at you know, how do these things look at from an external perspective? Because that gives them a sense of, you know, what shareholders would be interested in looking at. It also helps potentially if, you know, helps management for some of their contracts, especially if they're being remunerated on various things. So, you know, they're going to be interested in this stuff too. So by evaluating an entity's financial past, users are in a better position to form an opinion as to the entity's future financial health. Now that's quite a leading comment and you'll notice if we go back a couple of minutes ago we talked about very briefly that towards the end we were talking about the limitations of financial statement analysis and in this first bullet point you can identify what one of those is going to be in the sense that this analysis if you're using current financial information is based on events that have happened in the past does that indicate what the future will be? In some cases, yes. Um, but as we're seeing right at the moment, where events outside the normal scope of, of expectation can have huge impacts on a business that would not be picked up at all in the financials. Does it give us a clue? Absolutely. Is it helpful? Yes. Um, should it be the only thing you look at? No. And so with that in mind, what is really important with financial analysis is comparison points. If a company makes a $100 million profit, in as of itself, we can't tell if that's good or bad. It could be amazing. It could be really, really poor. We need to be able to compare it to something else. So are there equivalent figures from previous years? Are there figures in other financial statements? Um, how do we compare it to other entities? Uh, so the comparison point and what we use is going to be really important in terms of determining how useful this was. So the first type of analytical method we have is horizontal analysis. And with horizontal analysis, as the name suggests, it compares reported figures over time. Um, what we have here is the 2017 uh, financial statements from Woolworths, and we only have the 2017-2016 years over time is just comparing 2016 to 2017. So the dollar change will simply be the current year minus the previous year and whatever figures that you're looking at. 
uh, the percentage change will be the dollar change divided by the previous year. Uh, and that just gives you a small snapshot of what has changed. Um, obviously a good starting point. Trend analysis is very similar to horizontal analysis, but then just stretches it out using more data. The base year is set to 100. Now, depending on the data sources you get, you may have the years run from left to right, or you may have them run from right to left. Um, so just be aware of what you're using. In this case, the years run from left to right. And this data I picked up from data analysis. So again, a really useful source where you don't have to actually go into each of the individual annual reports. Look, there are other machine readable databases out there. Um, you know, there are loads that you can get access to. Obviously from what we're using, we have free access through the library. So, you know, you don't have to pay for these services, but even if you didn't have that access, you could go and hand collect this information if you needed to. So in this case, we have 2018 to 27, uh, 2008, I should say, to 2017. Uh, we've got total revenue, EBIT, and net profit after tax. So we've only taken three figures. You obviously could take more. We've set 2008 uh, to be the base year, and that's set to 100. So you'll notice that total revenue is set at 100, EBIT is set at 100, net profit after tax is set at 100. As you move along, each of the following years is compared to that base of 100. So if you move along, 2009 revenue is 106, moves to 110, 116, 18, 25, 130, 130. So it's going up through to 2015, and then we actually start to see a bit of a backslide. 2016, 124, 2017, 119. So it gives you a bit of a better sense of how those things are trending. Vertical analysis, as the name suggests, is comparing vertically. So that's comparing within the same statement. And what we're comparing to is some sort of anchor figure. When you're talking about revenues and expenses, you're talking about percentage of sales or percentage of revenue. So in this particular case, we do have revenue from the sale of goods or services right at the top. And then we have a small amount for other operating revenue. And then you have total operating revenue. Now, whether you choose the top line or the first, um, the first here, fifty-five, six, six, eight point six, it's not going to change anything materially. Um, look, I'd probably choose fifty-five, six, six, eight, and then everything is a percentage of that figure. So, cost of sales would be cost of sales divided by fifty-five. Profit or loss would be profit or loss divided by 55 and so on. So that gives you how important each component is as a percentage of the sales that they make. When you're looking at the balance sheet or the statement of profit or statement of financial position, it's all as a percentage of total assets. So your assets, all the asset line items are a percentage of total assets. Liability is a percentage of total assets. Equity is a percentage of total assets. Moving into ratio analysis, what ratio analysis done, what ratio analysis does is compares the relationship between two quantitative amounts. They don't always have to be from the same statement. So again, a profit of $1.5 billion could be really good or could be really terrible. It's only when you compare it to something else, like sales of $55 billion, that you start to get a sense of, is that good or is that bad? And again, that's only is that good or is that bad potentially for within that company. You'd have to then compare it across different companies across the industry to get an idea of how that how that particularly goes. Um, we do we can do it across different statements, um, but we do need to be aware that statement of profit or loss, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of financial position all capture slightly different things. And by that, I don't mean different financial, different accounting elements. What I mean by that is this idea of flow versus stock. A statement of profit or loss and a cash flow statement, these are flow statements. They happen over a period of time. So this revenue, the 55, doesn't just happen at a point. It happens over that whole 12-month period or you know period that you're looking at. 
The Statement of Financial Position reports stock amounts. So what they mean by stock or kind of a level amount is that total current assets is $6.994 billion at 30th of June, 2017. So the flow amounts happen over a year, but the Statement of Financial Position is just a snapshot. So if you're comparing two figures within the Statement of Profit or Loss, you can just compare them because you're comparing two flow figures. And so that's easy enough. They happen over the same period. If you're comparing something from the Statement of Profit or Loss and then from the Statement of Financial Position, you're comparing a flow with a stock amount. So what you need to do is take an average stock amount. So you wouldn't just use the 6.994 in total current assets. You'd use the average total current assets over the period. So you'd actually take the average of the 7427 and the 6994. It's a ballpark average because we don't know if that change happened late in the piece or early in the year, but it's better than just taking one or the other. So again, if you're comparing between statements, make sure if you're comparing a flow statement with a stock statement that you're using averages for the stock amounts. As already discussed, ratios, look, they're useful, but unless you're going to compare it to something, they don't really tell you a whole lot. And there's a whole bunch of different comparisons that you could make. You can do it over time within the same business. So you can just start to see, you know, how things are changing over a five year, 10 year, longer period of time. Are there major shifts? Is it kind of just moving slowly in one direction or the other? You can look intra-industry. So look at similar entities, oh, sorry, well, not similar entities, look at entities within the same industry and then compare their, compare their figures. So for example, you know, if you're looking at airlines, Qantas and Virgin are in the same industry. Um, so that's an example of what you could do in that space. If you're looking at industry averages, maybe you don't want to compare just to one competitor. Maybe you just want to get an industry average. So you compare that particular business with what is the norm across companies or across entities in that specific industry. And again, it gives you slightly, in a way, similar to intra-industry, intra but just a broader sample of competitor companies. And finally, inter-industry. So just somebody completely different. Um, the usefulness of this you know, is probably not as big as the rest because they're not operating in the same industry. They probably have different business models. So there may not be a huge reason to be looking at this um, to get insight into that particular entity. But to the extent that if you're an investor and you're making investment decisions across any particular business, it could be useful to understand, you know, a certain industries, you know, have a poor return on assets versus other industries and so on. So, I mean, it could be useful depending on what the scope of the decision making um, that you've got in front of you. So in terms of doing this, calculate a meaningful ratio. Uh, compare that ratio with something. It could be the entity the previous year. It could be the industry average. It could be something else. And then try to understand what's going on, what's changing. So if the profit margin has just dropped substantially within this entity from the prior year to this year, why did that happen? Can you understand? Can you come up with a plausible hypothesis as what has changed from one year to the next? If your ratio or the ratio of the, the company that you're looking at has changed substantially, but the competitors haven't, the industry hasn't, what's different about this particular business and the rest that it's not an industry effect that's going on, uh, it's something particular to you. Um, so for example, at the moment, we're seeing major I impacts on, you know, on sport. We're seeing revenues dropping across a whole range of different sports complete, you know, they're in the same, arguably the same industry, but it's happening everywhere. So just because if you were to compare one year within any of those particular sports, one year to last year, it'll look horrible. But if you compare it across all sports, you're seeing that's the same thing happening everywhere. So it's not overly surprising. There is something external which is happening that's affecting everybody. 
doesn't mean it's still not still not good, um, but at least it's sort of something external to the business. What we're going to do here is look at the five main blocks of ratios that we're going to be that we're going to be working with uh, this particular session. And again, all of these are defined um, with examples elsewhere. And I'd also urge you to go and find a company, go and look at whether you want want to look at their annual report directly or whether you want to get some of the financial data from a data aggregator like data analysis and then actually start calculating some of these out. The benefit of using something like an annual report is you actually get to see the figures you know, from the source document. So you can get to see where everything is and, and see how sometimes it's not always as clear cut to choose what particular item. The benefit of using a data aggregator is that information is already there and often there in a long time frame. So if you want to use 10 years, if you want to use 20 years, it's already set up for you. So it's really easy to export that out and then start to run these calculations yourself. So turning to the first one, profitability, profitability analysis. Um, look, if entities can't make profits, at least in the longer term, sort of investors aren't going to be super interested in them. And the ability to generate those profits and return and provide a return on investment is going to be hugely important for how healthy this particular entity is. So things like return on equity and return on assets show you their profitability on the equity base or their profitability on their asset base. The gross profit margin shows you how well a business is able, if it's a retailer or a manufacturer, to either buy or make product and then sell it at a higher price. So the bigger your gross margin, the better you're able to do that. The profit margin is the ultimate bottom line figure against sales. So if you have a 2% profit margin, it means of every $100 that you sell, you keep $2 in profit or you make $2 in profit. Is that good? Is that bad? It depends on the industry. But the profit margin is ultimately what hits the bottom line and the profit margin is a comparison between each of the sales revenue dollars that you make. Cash flow to sales ratio is picking up how cash flow from operations, well, how sales, I suppose, ultimately end up in cash flow from operations. Um, and cash is obviously a pretty important thing, thing to be generating. The next set of ratios are asset efficiency ratios. And these help understand how efficiently entities or companies are using their assets. Um, now, there are ways to improve this. You can keep the same level of kind of turnover or profit, um, but have fewer assets in play, or have the same amount of assets in play and then actually just be doing more business. So the asset turnover ratio is just a comparison between sales revenue and total assets. So again, just shows you how sort of how much your sales are compared to the assets you've got in play. Um, certain businesses, especially um, you know tech type businesses, may well have very few total assets, um, but their sales may be incredibly high. Whereas more bricks and mortar type operations will most likely have comparatively um, higher levels of assets compared to the revenue that they generate. Days inventory or times inventory or the kind of companion ratio for it, times inventory turnover, just indicates on average how quickly a particular business sells through its inventory. You know, so how many days, you know, you can kind of get a sense of how many days on average for their average inventory item do they hold on to their, in, you know, does it take them to sell their inventory? And obviously, the quicker you do that, the better it is. Um, but it is quite a broad brushstroke because we don't know the different lines of inventory. So this is just an overall kind of view of it. Days debtors ratio or times debtors turnover shows you how quickly they're able to collect um, on account. If you're seeing that blow out, that means they're having a harder time collecting from customers on account. If you see that shrinking, obviously their collection turnover is getting quicker, which is good because it means they're able to turn cash, turn sales into cash on a more expedited time frame. Liquidity analysis. This is 
probably a pretty important one right at the moment. Uh, the survival of an entity depends on its ability to pay its debts when they fall due. Uh, absolutely. We've talked a little bit about Dick Smith in the past. Uh, so a few years ago, Dick Smith uh, went into administration. And the reason for this was it just did not have the ability to pay its debts when they fell due. Um, they tried to generate cash by having massive sell by, by having massive sales into the Christmas period back in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, um, just and it didn't work unfortunately, and they were not able to do meet their obligations. So the current ratio is a comparison of current assets to current liabilities. Um, it shows you what proportion of current assets you have to current liabilities. You would like to see more current assets and current liabilities. That shows they've got an ability to pay everything is required. But you're going to find good businesses which have current ratios less than one. So their current assets are actually less than the current liabilities. The quick ratio is like a tighter version of the current ratio in that instead of just instead of being all current assets, it actually strips out inventory. And the reason it strips out inventory is if if you're a business and you're running into financial difficulty and all your current liabilities are falling due and you've got to pay off your debts, the, the ability to generate cash quickly, you're probably not going to be able to use all your inventory to do that. Um, you're going to have, if you're trying to sell off your inventory and you're trying to sell it quickly, you're going to have to mark that stuff down. And if you mark it down, you're not going to generate as much cash. So it's not going to be worth what it is on the books. So your ability to generate cash from your inventory very quickly is probably constrained somewhat. So the quick ratio strips out inventory. So it just looks at basically cash and accounts receivable in effect against current liabilities. And so it's a much tighter, much more conservative view of your ability to pay those debts. And lastly, I think we may have touched on this before in the previous topic, um, but the cash flow ratio shows you cash flow from operations against current liabilities. So again, you know, how much cash are you generating from your operating activities and how long, how many times or how long will it take you to pay off your current liabilities from that? Um, again, it's one of those ones where there's a bit of tension here in that you don't want to have too much cash or current assets sort of floating around to pay off your current debts because then it probably indicates you're not use, you're not utilizing them as well as you could. Um, and that's one of the things when reflecting on what's going on with a lot of businesses and, and again, sport, but I mean, I won't talk about Virgin um, because I think it's a slightly different case is that I don't think there are many businesses out there that if their entire revenue dried up for a period of six months, nine months, 12 months, just revenue went to zero, cash inflows went to zero, that they would have enough cash just lying around or fairly liquid assets just lying around that they could pay the things that they need to pay. Um, I just don't think that's reasonable because what it indicates is that those particular organizations would be sitting on liquid assets, which they're not utilizing in, you know, utilizing in some way to help drive their business forward. So, I mean, it's not surprising that you're seeing right now businesses run into trouble because this is for many cases, just such an un, and I hate to use the word unprecedented because it's it's not quite unprecedented. I mean, these things have happened before, but I suppose unexpected uh, turn of events. The fourth set of ratios that we're going to look at are around capital structure of a business. Now, we're not going to get into the debate here around uh, the pros and cons of using debt and, and what the sort of optimal, if there is an optimal weighting between debt and equity within a particular business. Uh, but what we're going to look at are some of the key ratios that you can use just to help you get a handle on kind of where they where they sit. Now, on one end of the spectrum, if you have, if an organization has no debt on its books, it's probably missing out on, on opportunities, especially now at the moment with debt being quite cheap. Uh, the other side of that is if, you're almost in, almost completely levered, and we have seen examples of this, you know, over history. Is that you're you become incredibly risky if there is a downturn. So the first three ratios there, the debt to equity, debt ratio, and equity ratio, you only they basically they'll give you a different number, but they in essence mean the same thing. You only need to calculate one of them, and it really turns on 
the one that you prefer to use and you know understand. Um, personally, I like the debt ratio. Um, that comparison between sort of debt to assets um, or debt to asset ratio to me makes a lot of sense because you get a sense of you know what their debt ratio is. Um, so you know if it's forty percent, sixty percent, ninety percent. That's my preferred one, but you know, again, that's really up to up to different people about what they prefer to use. But they do ultimately show you the same thing. The interest coverage ratio picks up how much profit before interest and tax is available to pay their finance costs. Now, I say pay their finance costs, um, even though you know profit isn't necessarily cash, and you can't pay something with profit, but it gives you a sense of you know how much. Um, they earn before they have to pay any interest or any tax, or pay any interest or any tax. Um, so the higher the, the higher the ratio there, the more easily they can cover their interest payments. Um, the debt coverage ratio is looking at their non-current liabilities, which you know will often be debt, but there may be other things in non-current liabilities. But it's it shows you how much these non-current liabilities are compared against cash flow from operations. Um, you know, and, and obviously. If you're not generating cash from operations, there's only two other places you can generate it from. One is from financing cash flows, so either borrowing more or getting money from equity participants, or by selling off property, plant, and equipment or other non-current assets. Neither of those are long-term solutions. So again, it gives you an idea of how much, you know, from your operations you're able to cover your debt and you know slowly pay it back as needs be. Finally, uh, market performance analysis. Now, a lot of these figures, not not all, but some of these uh, will actually include information from outside of the financials. Uh, not the first one though. So the first one is the net tangible asset backing per share. And the idea of this is there are assets on the business, or assets in entities, uh, which aren't separable from the entity. They're not, you can't really sort of take them out and sell them off. Um, so a lot of intangible assets are things which you know can't really sell to anyone. So in a, in essence, what they're doing here is basically stripping out all of those intangible assets to just get what are the sort of tangible assets there and how many of them are there per, what is the, the dollar value per share. Got to be careful using that because as we've talked about in the statement of financial position, assets and how they get included on the balance sheet and then also the figures used um, there are some rules around that. So it doesn't necessarily indicate how much those assets are worth per share. It just shows the accounting tangible assets per share. Earnings per share, like the name suggests, is earnings per share. It is the profitability of the entity against the, the, the weighted average number of shares out there. Um, you can get share information from the financials. Um, there's also, again, available through a lot of the data aggregators which exist. Operating cash flow per share, like the name suggests, it is the operating cash flow per share. Dividend per share, you know, we're getting a bit of a, a consistency with this, is showing you the dividends uh, paid per share. And finally, the price earnings ratio. This uses the market price, uh, so whatever time that happens to be, so just the price on, on, um, on the exchange. And, it, and that's a price per share against the earnings per share ratio. So it shows you, um, in essence, how much the market is willing to pay for a dollar of earnings. The higher that figure is, um, the more excited the, the market is around that particular share and the more they're willing to pay for it, uh, the lower it is, the less excited they are about it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the market is correct. The market misprices stuff all the time. Um, but it gives you an idea of what's popular and what's not. So, you know, in doing all of this, we're trying to link all these ratios to describe the financial health of the firm. I mean, no one ratio is going to tell us, tell the entire story. And that's why it's, you know, financial statement analysis, there's certainly a fair bit of art in it. What we're trying to do is almost from the outside, try to understand what's happening within the business and help use that to make predictions about the future. Now, that's not always going to be easy. Um, it helps us interpret what's going on. 
Is it the silver bullet? No. Um, but it does help us give us some more information about where things have been and can that give us some inkling as to what is coming up in the future. We do need to make sure we're aware of the limitations, though, as already as already noted. What is the, I suppose, the nature of the financial statements and the data which is recognised within them? There are things which we know which are important, which are not in financial statement information, and even if they are in financial statement inf information, they may not necessarily represent the actual value of that particular item. So it's just to be aware of the rules around the accounting numbers, which is why even if you're not doing accounting, if you're going more into the investment side of things, having an understanding of how an entity has generated the numbers that it has and presented them on the financial statements, understanding the rules and the judgments and the estimations involved in that is really important. The ratios themselves, I mean, they're not perfect. Um, and so just understanding mechanically what the ratios do and how they work together and, and you're playing around with them, um, that's going to be important too. It is not the only financial analysis tool which is out there. You know, there are others, there are other things you can be doing. Um, you know, there are technical analysts who do things differently from this. This is sort of working more on the fundamental side of things. Um, but it is, again, still a useful set of tools to consider. But again, it's not the only one. And finally, and importantly, there are information beyond the reported numbers, which is going to be hugely crucial that will affect the future. You only have to look at what's happening right now to just know that that is true. If you look at the financial statements of any of these entities uh, at the 30th of June 2019, nothing in that is predictive of what 30 June 2020 figures are going to be like. It's going to be, they're just going to be different. Um, and that's because of something which has happened, which no one could have expected to, to affect businesses the way that it has. So to wrapping up, um, financial statements, they do assist users in their decision making and they should. Um, you shouldn't be making financial investment decisions purely on the logo of a business or whether you not whether you like the CEO. I mean, those can be important things, but shouldn't be the only thing that you're using. Uh, financial analysis refers to the assessment of an entity's financial position and profitability. Something on its own is of limited usefulness. What does it compare to over what time period against what competitors? You know, these are important things to consider. And the things that we've looked at, again, at a high level, um, it is what, very much worth your while to go in and dig around and play with these and, and pick out companies and try this yourself. The various analytical methods help provide further insight, but they do have limitations.